I'd like to kick tonight off with um, our headline speaker, Mr. Ulrich Oberpiller, who is an exceptional individual possessing an immense wealth of knowledge when it comes to birds of prey. His captivating bird courses have garnered attention from throughout Africa um, and beyond. And whether you, whether or not you're able to personally attend one of these courses, his book, Raptors of Southern Africa, is an, an invaluable resource to uh, that should not be overlooked. It's a literary masterpiece that delves into the ma majestic world of birds of prey uh, and provides readers with a comprehensive understanding uh, of these magnificent creatures. Ulrich's passion for ornithology shines through on every page, making the bo this book a must-have for bird enthusiasts and nature lovers uh, alike. So with that, it's my extreme pleasure to introduce you all to Mr. Ulrich Oberpiller. Ulrich, if you're there, you can take it away. Yes, good evening, um, and thank you very much for that introduction. Um, it's great to be here. Thank you for hosting this, and also thank you to all the um, attendees, and I uh, hope that you're going to enjoy my presentation. So, as Caitlin has just said, I'm going to talk about the buzzards, the harriers, and the kites of Africa. Um, now, this is quite a large group. I just uh, calculated how many species there are altogether, and that's uh, 24. And they're obviously three groups, so I'm going to take an hour per species, and that's going to keep us busy for a little bit of time. Um, so um, I thought about this presentation for quite some time, and I wondered, well, how am I going to handle this? How am I going to address this? And eventually I decided I'm not going to do a formal presentation, but I'm rather going to tell you a little bit of a story. And as you know, every good story really starts with um, a very simple uh, heading, and that is namely Once Upon a Time. So I'm also going to start with Once Upon a Time. There was a young lady that had just graduated from university, and her name um, is Kipibi. And um, she actually excelled in geology specifically and ornithology. And she had a specific interest in the uh, birds of prey. And um, guess what, actually specifically then in the buzzards, the harriers and the kites. And because she was young, um, she had all the theoretical knowledge, but she also wanted to gain some practical knowledge. And so she decided she's going to um, engage with these birds and really get to grips with all these birds. And to do that, she would actually go on a tour um, of Africa. So she got herself a good outfit that would uh, and, uh, be in good stead in, in the rest of Africa as well, not only at home. And she got herself a new uh, field guide on the buzzards, the hairiest kites of Africa. And uh, off she went and she had a look then at the map uh, where she actually wanted to go to in the whole of Africa to see the various species that belong to this group. So she decided to start in Cape Town, because that's the southern point of Africa, and uh, travel through Africa and eventually then end up in Kenya, Nairobi, because that really is her home um, city. And um, so she's going to go on this tour. Now, she asked me to guide a little bit, and because I'm more familiar with this, what is happening in South Africa, quite a bit of this tour is actually taking place in South Africa, um, and then we'll switch over to the rest of Africa and see those birds that we haven't seen yet. And as I said just now, she decided to start in Cape Town, and uh, we then have a look what is happening there in Cape Town. Now, Cape Town is quite well known for its Table Mountain, and the mountain really gives a wide diversity of habitats. And so it's quite phenomenal, the variety of birds of prey that one can actually see in and around Cape Town. So what Kibibi did is the first thing is she went to the beach. Um, and there then she encountered, um, maybe not a species, but certainly made encounter with the first um, creature that was in, of importance, and that was a kite. Now. Why do I bring in a kite like this here? Um, and that's quite important because we all know what a kite is that you fly on a string. 
And the wild kites and the raptors that are called kites, there to a certain degree, they're similar because what they all share is a, they are magnificent flyers. If one looks at the other groups that I'm going to discuss, the buzzards, they basically belong to the genus Butio and they're all very similar. The harriers, they all belong to the genus Cygnus and they're also quite a uh, circus rather. They're all quite similar. But the kites are quite a diversity, and what they share is that they have with these uh, phenomenal powers of flight. So whenever we think of the kites, then we think of the artificial kite as well, and it will guide us in the, in the right direction. So from the beach, then she went into some other parts of around Cape Town. Uh, here she is at uh, Blauberg Strand. And there, the first bird that she actually encountered in that area was sitting there on a post. A sort of medium-sized raptor, a little bit smaller than a fish eagle, African fish eagle. And in summer months, this is quite a well-known raptor in Africa. In southern Africa, especially in the western parts, it's quite well-known. And I'm sure that many of you actually recognize this here as a skip buzzard. Now, the skip buzzard comes in all kinds of um, uh, uh, color forms. The shape and the size would obviously always be the same but from the very dark individual to the lighter colored individual that you see there and really everything in between. So this is not going to be a presentation on identification of raptors. So I'm not going to go into a lot of detail as far as identification is concerned. But what I want to mention that in many field guides, a step buzzard nowadays is no longer identified as a step buzzard, but it is rather identified as a common buzzard. And I think there's quite a lot of confusion. Why is it not a step buzzard anymore? And why is it a common buzzard? So let me just show you one of each. Um, on the left-hand side, uh, the darker bird is actually a common buzzard. And the one on the right-hand side, the slightly paler bird, is a step buzzard. Um, but the color is not a good um, characteristic to distinguish between them, because as I said already, they have a lot of color variation. But if one has a look at the scientific name, then the common buzzard is Butio Butio, and that applies to all the various subspecies. And then the uh, step buzzard, depending on what author you follow, is either a separate species or often recognized as a subspecies. So it's either Butio Butio Bulfinus or it is Butio Bulfinus. And so we see that the, um, the common buzzard is actually a wider species and the whole of that species does not visit Africa. It's really only that subspecies that we normally then refer to as the state buzzard. So if you have a look at a distribution map here of um, the whole of um, uh, the distribution, then we see in Europe, the common buzzard is actually a resident bird. So it does not visit us here. And then here as one that travels into the steppes of um, um, Asia and also part of Northern Europe here. That is where the step buzzard then occurs, the specific subspecies. And that is a subspecies that actually comes to visit us in Africa, the whole of Africa, where you can see the distribution map. So I personally still prefer the name step buzzard because it's really just that subspecies here. The more Eastern subspecies, they obviously migrate south into parts of Asia, but what is known as a subspecies for penis, that is the one that visits us here in, 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 uh, in the whole of Africa where they do occur. Then there's another bird that actually looks quite similar that you also find around Cape Town. But wherever you find it, you will uh, see that it associates with forest and also with exotic plantations. And because of this association with forest, it is obviously the known as the forest buzzard. It's a little bit paler than the um, step buzzard. But most importantly, this is a bird that actually occurs in southern Africa throughout the year. There is the distribution. The yellow area of the distribution is where they breed. And then after breeding at the beginning of spring and summer, then they move into that eastern part of southern Africa as well, um, only to return later on in the uh, year to breed again in the southern, the southern part of the Cape region. So this is our forest buzzard. And then there's the last buzzard that also occurs in the Cape region around Cape Town. And that is normally known as a Cape mystery buzzard. 
Now, why is it called a Cape Mystery Buzzard? For the very simple reason that it occurs around the Cape and because it's still a mystery. As far as I know, um, and I've tried to find out the latest information, but as far as I know, there's still uncertainty what is actually happening with this bird. Because this bird looks very much like a step buzzard, not 100% like a step buzzard, but mostly so. But they do breed in southern Africa. They are certainly not um, uh, forest buzzards, uh, because forest buzzards breed. And these also normally breed um, on cliffs and not on trees. So I know that there was a genetic study that was uh, attempted, but that was, as far as I know, never completed. So why these birds actually breed in Southern Africa, maybe they're not just step buzzards that actually decided they like South Africa and they're going to stay here. I'm not quite sure, but um, certainly this is still a little bit of a mystery bird. And so Kibibi was quite happy with a few birds that she's seen around Cape Town. And so it was time for her to actually grab her belongings and to travel a little bit north of Cape Town to the West Coast National Park. And um, the West Coast National Park is not only important because of the, uh, the ocean that uh, forms a very specific area there, but also the famous and the famous like vegetation that we have in that park. And there she saw a very special bird, and that is the um, Black Harrier. Uh, now, we've just heard of the Black Harrier already, so I'm not going to go into more detail as far as that is concerned, because Dr. Rob Simmons in a moment is going to tell us a lot of information about that. Let me just um, emphasize that it's a bird that is um, endemic to Southern Africa. So it breeds in that green region of the distribution map. And then after breeding, they disperse, disperse more widely into parts of Southern Africa. All right, now while we are busy with a harrier, let me just talk about the harriers in general. Um, the harriers are sort of medium-sized raptors, about the size of a crow. As we can see here, they've got long legs and long tails, but most importantly, they have got long and narrow wings. And that also really makes them very good flyers. Now, the way that they fly is that they actually quarter up and down in an area. They normally prefer vegetation that is fairly low, like paintballs or taru or scrub or grasslands. And they fly fairly low, so that's about five to 10 meters above the ground. They quarter up and down, so you see them arriving and then disappearing in the distance again and just zigzagging around, often holding the wings in that shallow V that we see here. And then they look down towards the ground and they listen as well because they seem to have a very uh, sharp sense of hearing. And once they see or hear something, that they put out the air brakes by putting out the tail, as you can see it here and then they drop down to the ground and they catch whatever small animal they may get hold of. So whether it's, it's a, a rodent or a, a large insect or whatever the case may be, um, that is really what they feed on. Now, all the harriers, they breed on the ground, except the spotted harrier, which is a bird of Australia, but all the other harriers in the rest of the world, they breed on the ground. But most importantly, again, is that they prefer open, low vegetation, and they've got this habit of quartering, zigzagging up and down over that area and looking for their prey. Now, this uh, second bird that I'm showing here is actually called a, a, um, a marsh um, hawk because this is an American bird. And I just want to emphasize that in America, often the terminology that is being used is slightly different from what we are using in, uh, in Africa and also in the rest of the old world. So from um, the West Coast, she then moved into the interior of Southern Africa and she made a little stopover in the Karoo. And there is a windmill and you can see the beautiful landscape of the Karoo. And obviously most important, there is a fence as well and there's some other perches. And on these perches, one would regularly then see again that step buzzard that I referred to already. So they sometimes sit on the low bushes as this one here, or they sit on fence posts, or they seem to carry a telephone pole around with them wherever they're going, so that they've got something to sit on. And the reason why they do that, like all the other buzzards, they actually perch hunt. So they sit on these prominent perches and they just survey their surroundings 
or small prey, mostly rodents, and then they fly down and they catch those rodents on the ground. So it's not that they're lazy or they're not doing anything, they're really perch hunting, and um, in that way they, they do catch their prey. Um, now the buzzards, they, most of them belong to the uh, genus Butio. There are some that actually belong to other genera, but the most important one is the genus Butio. Um, and as I mentioned already, with the step buzzard, they are slightly smaller than an African fish eagle. They're fairly robustly built birds, so they are not very agile flyers. And so to catch um, uh, small animals on the ground, that is really what they do specialize on. A number of species are resident in the areas where they occur. And then we also have a number of species that actually visit Africa from the, from the northern hemisphere. So like many of the other large raptors, they've got a not too long a tail, but long broad wings, which obviously give them the ability for soaring flight. And again, I uh, just show an American species here, because in America, they are not known as buzzards. If you talk to an American about a buzzard, then they refer to a buzzard, what we would actually call a vulture. And to, to them, this would be a hawk. So this is a red-tailed hawk. And we in Africa would have referred to this as a red-tailed buzzard because they also belong to the genus, the Butio species. Good, let us then carry on. And we're going to go to the Nukeng Nature Reserve, which is just north of Pretoria. And the Nukeng is actually quite well known for a specific raptor, which is seen there very often, and that is the African cuckoo hawk. Now, you may ask, now, why on earth do I show a hawk here in this presentation? And the reason is very simple, because the name cuckoo hawk is actually a bit of a misnomer. The cuckoo hawk is actually a kind of specialized kite. So, as far as I know, it was never called a kite, but if one have a, has a look at the long pointed wings and the fact that they're really very good flyers, that gives you an indication that it's not just an ordinary hawk, but it actually belongs to this uh, smaller group of the kites. And the reason why it's called a cuckoo hawk, um, the coloration looks very much like any of the larger cuckoo species with a gray head and the barring on the, on the belly and uh, part of the chest. But obviously, they are raptors and they catch a variety of smaller prey like insects and, and some others. Now, from Dino King, we are, oh, yes, yes, our distribution map first of all. So it's quite a widely distributed bird in Africa. It's a resident bird. And um, in uh, most of Africa, it's actually not a threatened bird. So they are not very common, but they are certainly not uh, threatened in, in any way. And from Dino King, we are moving a little bit north again, and we go to Nailsflay, which is also a nature reserve. And it is very well known for its uh, floodplain of the Nail River. And this floodplain, quite obviously, is an ideal habitat for marsh areas. And yes, here you would certainly see at least one of the marsh areas that occur in Africa. And probably you may, if you're lucky, you may see a second one as well. Now, the marsh area that uh, virtually always occurs on this marsh here is the African marsh area, which is basically just a sort of a brown area that lives in primarily in marshes. So from the habitat point of view, it's also more easy to identify. And like the marsh areas and the other areas normally do, is that they quarter up and down over this open marsh and they look for small um, birds to a certain degree, but a variety of smaller animals as well. Now, like many of the other aquatic animals, uh, the marsh area is not doing well in South Africa, although it seems to be doing better in the rest of Africa. Um, and that is quite uh, simply because of the habitat uh, change that is taking place for its uh, aquatic habitat. So the distribution, it has a fairly wide distribution in Africa obviously always associated with that specific habitat. And uh, as I said already, if one considers that habitat, it should not be too difficult to identify this bird. Then the, um, this is also still a marsh area, which is a rather dark individual. And um, as I said already, they've got those long, uh, uh, narrow wings, and they've got that typical habit of quartering like all the other areas do. 
Then our second species, which is really a vagrant to South Africa, and thus one is really quite unlikely to see it at Dale's Play, but it has been seen there on a number of occasions, and that is the Western Marsh area. And what I show here is specifically a male, and this is obviously a bird that then arrives then from the Northern Hemisphere. As we can see on the map, it's more common in the central parts of Africa as a non-breeding visitor, but they do come to South Africa from time to time. So there on the left-hand side is a male. Now the harriers or the, the um, adults have got yellow eyes. And you can see that very clearly with the male there. And the bird on the bottom, on the right-hand side, that is actually a young bird. And that is indicated by the dark eyes. But the females really look very similar to the young bird, although the female then would also have a yellow eye. Now just coming back to the um, black harrier that I mentioned already, there, the young bird also has got yellow eyes, but otherwise the dark eye always indicates a young bird with a yellow bright eye that would indicate a, an adult bird. And while Kibibi was at uh, Nile's place, you also had a quick look at the roan antelope, which are obviously not a bird, but they're also endangered, so they're quite of interest from that point of view. And then from Nile's play, we move a little bit northeast again, and we go to Makuba's Kluwef. Now, Makuba's Kluwef is really a gorge, and there's a main road uh, passing through it. But the rest of the Kluwef is really beautifully vegetated with, um, with forest areas. But there are also exotic plantations, and what is of interest that some of the tallest planted trees in Africa, as far as I know, they actually grow in that Makuba's Kluwef area, and those are some giant eucalypts. Now, quite a number of those really tall trees, they are well identified and you can find your way to them. And when you get to one of these tall trees, then you should look up into that tree canopy. And that is obviously quite high above you. But if you're lucky, you're going to see up there a very special bird, and that is the bat hawk. Now, again, why do I include the bat hawk here in my presentation? Because the bat hawk is actually also a kite, so that is really a misnomer there as well should be called a bat kite, if we uh, want to be more correct. But the bat hawk, as the name indicates, it uh, feeds primarily on bats. So it actually stays quietly in the tree for most of the day. And then in the evening, as the sun is setting and the bats become active, then they fly out. And that is obviously why they've got those large eyes to be able to see their prey. And usually, within a very short period of time, they've uh, or two or three bats, and that is their meal for the evening, and then they return to their perch again. But if one has a look at them in flight, again, one can see those, um, those um, uh, um, kite-like characteristics of the long wings, and certainly they're very good flyers to be able to catch those kites in flight. Uh, those bats in flight, I'm sorry, the bats in flight. Um, then, obviously, we have to go to the Kruger National Park, which is not only well known for its wildlife, but also for its raptors. And there we're going to see a number of raptors, especially in summer months, we're going to see the yellow bird kite, which is uh, quite a common bird, often occurs in the rest camps and also in urban areas outside the park. Um, and then the other one that is not as common in Southern Africa, but certainly more common in many of the other parts of Africa is the black kite. Um, and these two birds, quite obviously, are closely related. And thus, if one has a look at the distribution map here, um, there are quite a number of um, black kite subspecies that don't occur in Africa at all. But what we basically have here is that those birds that actually breed in Africa and thus stay here throughout the year, although they migrate a little bit within Africa, those are the yellow bog kites. And uh, those birds that come from the northern hemisphere, from Europe, those are the black kites, and they overwinter in Africa, and they obviously do not breed here. So their um, migratory patterns and their area of breeding is quite different. And so some authorities regard two as two separate species, and others actually regard them as two subspecies of the same species. Now, it doesn't matter how you look at it from a scientific point of view. Um, they are really quite easy to tell it apart because the yellow bill kite obviously has its uh, yellow bill and the black kite has a black bill. 
although the juveniles of both of them have got um, black pills as well, so they're a little bit more difficult um, than to tell apart. And then there's another similar kite, which is the red kite, which is really a bird of Europe. And it occurs sometimes in Africa and even a little bit more south than what this uh, distribution map indicates. So at the first glance, it looks very much like a uh, black kite, but there are some differences between uh, this and the black kite. And the reason why I showed specifically, because there are quite a number of these type of kites in the rest of um, the old world, and they are collectively referred to as the Milvus kites. So they all belong to the genus Milvus. And as I said, it's not only our yellow boat kite and the black kite and the red kite. If one, for instance, goes to Hong Kong, there's a subspecies of black kite that occurs there among the skyscrapers. It's quite fascinating to see it there. But uh, the shape of the wing and the uh, deeply forked tail that in indicates it always as one of the Milvus kites. Then still in Kruger, there are some harriers, especially in the northern grassy areas of Kruger. You may see the Montagues harrier. Again, I'm just showing the male here because the females and the um, youngsters are quite uh, difficult. But Montagues harrier is quite a colorful bird, and so it's not uh, so difficult to identify. But uh, it is a bird that's not very common in South Africa. Um, in other parts of Africa, it may be a little bit more common. And again, to see it perched, it doesn't happen very often. Normally, you would see it in the typical area style, flying up and down over that open area. And in the same area, you may also see the pallet area, which looks uh, similar to a certain degree. Now, the distribution differs a little bit. The pallet area also normally uh, prefers a slightly more arid habitat. So in Southern Africa, if one would go to Botswana, you're more likely to see it there than in the Kruger Park, but they certainly have been reported in the Kruger Park. And then outside of Southern Africa, there's a third harrier that actually looks very similar, and that is the hidden harrier. Um, so if we have a look at the distribution maps of the three, then we see at the top Montague's harrier and pallet harrier actually got fairly similar distributions. And they uh, visit us as, uh, as non-breeding visitors in our summer months, in Southern Africa, certainly. And uh, they breed in the yellow area of the distribution in Europe and Asia. And then, as you can see in the middle on the right-hand side, the hen harrier is a bird that uh, usually occurs in North Africa, north of the Sahara. But they do occur south of the Sahara from time to time. And thus, in those uh, northern countries, one may have a chance to to encounter it as well. Good, then from the Kruger Park, KBB has decided to go to the escarpment, to, to the Sotansburg. And on the way there, she encountered the black wing kite, which I'm sure that many people know it. And it's always been called a black shoulder kite. But with the changes in their species, um, this one is now separate from what is still called the black shoulder kite, which occurs in Australia. And that's the species that occurs with us in Africa. We now refer to it as the black wing kite, which in my opinion is actually also a more appropriate name because it doesn't really have a black shoulder. It's really the wrist and the wing tip that is um, black in color. And so a black wing kite is certainly a much more appropriate name. So this bird often occurs along the roads, uh, sitting on the telephone post and uh, uh, open perches. And there they, they look at the surroundings and they survey them for, for mice. They're really specialists in catching mice. These are also birds that one will see um, hovering quite um, often, also looking down for their prey and parachuting down. But this is quite a common bird in many parts of Africa. And so, as I said, I think this is quite a well-known bird to virtually everybody. And then in the Sotransburg, we get the jackal buzzard, which is one of the really beautiful buzzards that we have in, um, in Africa. It's really a bird that is confined to southern Africa. And uh, some of them have got more white on the chest than others. But it is a bird that is always associated with mountain areas. And there they primarily, again, in typical buzzard fashion, they, um, uh, they hunt small um, mammalian prey. Often they perch hunt, they hover, but they 
slopes off quite often. But if we have a look at the distribution map, they're really confined to South Africa and then also the southwestern areas of Namibia. Now, like many of the other buzzards, they breed in that platform nest, which they normally build in uh, trees, um, sometimes on cliffs as well. And there's the chick. And as the chick then grows older and it's the fletches, then it really looks very different to the adult. So I haven't really mentioned many of the juvenile birds because from an identification point of view, they are really quite difficult. But one should never just look at the color, but also the habits and the behavior and the habitat. And obviously also the size and the shape really are very important to identify these species. Now from the uh, Sotmansburg, we're going to cross the border into Zimbabwe. And there, Kibibi then went to the Chimani Mani Mountains. And there then we have a close relative of the jackal buzzard, which is known as the auger buzzard. Now, Simon Thompson is going to um, elaborate more on this bird, so I'm not going to say much about it, except to mention that it's really the counterpart of the jackal buzzard um, in the northern regions of Africa. So it's got the white underpart, not the rufous and black like the jackal buzzard. And as we can see, that it goes quite widely all the way up to uh, Somalia. And there's also a more isolated um, population in Namibia and also in southwestern Angola. What I'm showing you here is a female with a black on the throat. And there's the male with the, uh, with the white throat. Um, and they occur quite widely, except in the far northern regions of Somalia. They often have a rufous wash on their underparts, and then they're often referred to as archer's buzzard. Um, but it's uh, usually just regarded as a color form or maybe a subspecies and not really as a separate species to the auger buzzard. Good, then while uh, Gabibi was in Chimani Mani, she also saw the um, European honey buzzard. Now, the screen that was shown right at the beginning with the bird sitting in the tree, that was actually a honey buzzard. And the honey buzzard is not a Butio species, so it's not a true buzzard, but it belongs to the group of honey buzzards. So it looks very similar to the, the true buzzards, but um, there are some important differences in the food source and obviously in the body shape, etc., etc. So what we have here on the left-hand side is a female with a brown head. And on the right hand side, there is a male with a gray head. Adults always have got yellow or orangey eyes, and the youngsters have got dark eyes. And as the name indicates, it's a bird that actually breeds in Europe and visits us here as non breeding birds um, in Africa. Now, if we have a look at that head shape there, then it's really very characteristic because the honey buzzard head always reminds you very much of a pigeon. So if you see a buzzard-sized bird with a pigeon head, then you immediately know that this must be a honey buzzard. And in Africa, that would be the most European honey buzzard. And there is the reason why it's called a honey buzzard. So they don't eat so much the honey, but we did the bees and wasps. Um, they eat some other food as well, but uh, they've got fairly weak uh, feet, unlike the other buzzards. And so that prey is certainly ideal for them. Now, from here, we're going to travel all the way to Angola, to Luanda. But on the way there, Kibibi actually decided to just make a stopover to look at the giant sable antelope, because that's also an endangered species. And as we know that many of the raptors are endangered, so, so this is certainly not an exception. But uh, she was very happy with herself there that she eventually um, arrived in Luanda. And especially to the east of Luanda, there's a bird that she was looking for, and that is the red neck buzzard. Now, the red neck buzzard is um, also a Butio species. It's smaller than many of the other Butios. And in the area of distribution, it's a relatively common bird. And it seems to also expand its distribution because they have been seen in Southern Africa in the last couple of years. So in flight, it's usually characterized by its long um, uh, reddish tail. And you can see where the name redneck buzzard comes from there. 
and they normally sit quietly again in a tree and they perch on in the same fashion that the others buzzards then would also do. Now from Angola, I'm not quite sure what transport he used, but in any case, uh, Kibibi then went to northeastern Nigeria, and there was a special bird that she really wanted to see, and that is the scissors tailed kite. Um, in a typical kite fashion, the long pointed wings and very good flyers. We can see that they actually migrate within Africa. So in new areas where they do not breed, and in other areas where they do breed, um, but they seem to be a relatively common bird in that uh, part of the world. Now, the, um, the, uh, the scissor tail kite belongs to a group that we often refer to as the Elanus kites. Now, a black winged kite is actually belongs to the genus Elanus, and so there are a number of kites like this letter winged kite on the right hand side from Australia that look similar, and thus we refer to them as the Elanus kites. So we've seen the Milvus kites already, and these are then the Elanus kites, which also do occur in Africa and represented by the um, scissor tail kite and also the black wing kite. All right, and then as a last stopover, Kibibi went to Kenya, um, and there she wanted to see a number of birds and familiarize herself with those. Um, and the first bird was a long-legged buzzard. Now, I must admit that I probably gave Kibibi a little bit of wrong advice because um, the uh, long-legged buzzard is certainly not a common bird in Kenya. It uh, is a vagrant, so she didn't see a, a long-legged buzzard. But at least here I can show you what it looks like. It's a very variable bird from very dark to very pale and everything in between. And it's probably best identified by its size and by its uh, body shape. So it's large and more eagle-like in body shape. Um, and uh, as you can see, it has got a specific distribution area in, uh, in, in, in Africa. And then also breathing in the northern hemisphere in, in parts of Asia. Then she also had a look at the mountain buzzards. She specifically went to the Everdeers National Park. To find the uh, mountain buzzard there. Now, for a very long time, the mountain buzzard and the forest buzzard in South Africa were considered to be the same species, but in the meantime, they are split into two different species. And uh, the mountain buzzard is certainly more heavily marked than the southern African forest buzzard, but their behavior to a certain degree is, uh, is quite similar. And then the last species that um, Kibibi wanted to see is um, also called a buzzard, but it's not a Butio buzzard, so it's uh, not a true buzzard, and that is the grasshopper buzzard, and she, she specifically went to Tsavo East National Park for that, and there she saw this, um, this beautiful adult grasshopper buzzard. Now the name indicates what they eat, in addition to some small mammalian prey, and um, as we can see, they also migrate every birds within Africa, uh, breeding in the northern area of the distribution and then the non-breeding birds in the, in the southern area of the um, distribution. And so, although she missed out on a few birds, but we basically covered uh, 24 species, and eventually um, the BV went back to Nairobi, as I said, that is really where she was born and where she lived. And uh, you will recognize, if you speak Swahili, then you will recognize the name Kibibi. Um, now, I believe it means a little lady or a, a um, little princess. Now, as far as I'm concerned, a princess should always be beautiful and pretty. And so if we have a look at our raptors that I've just discussed, then the name Kibibi is very apt for them because the harriers and the buzzards and the kites of Africa, these are the babies of Africa, these are the pretty ones. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Ulrich. Uh, that was a phenomenal talk. That's um, Buzzards have always been uh, that group of, of raptors that have been difficult to identify, right? Um, they look so much like other 
other brown raptors, especially you know the the the, the juveniles that are so you know with the mottled brown and. So thank you so much. You you cleared up so many, um, so many questions that I had uh, 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 through the years on how how do I know that's a that's a forest buzzard as opposed to a step buzzard or, or something like that. So thank you so much. That was a fantastic talk, uh, and and that was a great. It, it was really exciting to see how how the different buzzard buzzards span across the African continent. Um, really really cool. Um, we're not going to take questions from the audience immediately. What we're going to do is we're going to wait. Uh, we're going to go through um, to to west, uh, western the Western Cape to to go visit Dr. Rob Simmons uh, to see what he's been doing in uh, with the Black Harriers down in that region. Uh, in A few kilometers northwest of Table Mountain, the landscape flattens. Pristine dunes line the coast. This is the home of the Black Harrier. A master circler of the windy African coast, this raptor is found nowhere else in the world. Unlike the Black Eagle, the Black Harrier raises several chicks during the breeding season. But the fact that they nest flat on the ground means they face far greater risks. Not much was known about this unique bird until, 11 years ago, raptor biologist Rob Simmons chose to follow them in their main breeding grounds, the West Coast National Park. 25, 30 odd years ago, I came to Africa, 80, 90 species of, of raptors around. It was just heaven. Fell in love with the bird. Here's a fascinating species. It's polygonous. Uh, it nests on the ground. It's relatively easy to study. Coming to Africa, it was an obvious thing to come and look at the African marsh areas and the black areas. Here's two stunning birds. Almost no work been done on them, surprisingly. Here's an endemic species, black area, that no one was studying. So Andrew Jenkins, Adet Curtis and myself all arrived at about that same time at the same conclusion. Here's an endemic species, really need some, some work done on it. And that's how I started off with, with black areas. Here in the, the southwestern corner of Africa, we've got the core breeding area of the Black Harrier in the Feinbos, in the Rhinosterfeld. It is an endemic species. It does go into Namibia. We think it might breed there, but it hasn't been um, proven yet. It has a very small population. And my study is to find out why it is so rare. And to give you some idea, we, we think there is about between 1,000 and 2,000 individual Black Harriers in the world. It's a tiny population. We think there's about probably 500, 700 breeding pairs of black harriers. We don't know why they're so rare, but we've got some ideas, uh, and that is very much to do with habitat. In this southwestern corner, we've got some large protected areas, with some of the private nature reserves like the Atlas Montane, we've got Kuburg Nature Reserve, we've got Rondeburg, where we've been doing some of our work, the West Coast National Park, which is a big chunk of, of coastal strand film. This is where the Harriers are found. If you go outside that, you do find some Harriers, but it's very much lower, very much lower numbers. They need this pristine felt in which to put their nests and in which to forage. So this is a female black Harrier. She's a breeding bird. We've just caught her on the Valshatri trap. Um, she is about 30 odd percent larger than the male, so there's reverse size dimorphism. The females pretty much always larger in the raptors. Um, as you can see, she's uh, black throughout except for the underwing there. Very large, very broad wings. We're spending a lot of time on the wing during the day. Um, hunting for mice, birds and that sort of thing, lizards. One to two meters above the, uh, above the ground. Very broad tail for those quick turns. Uh, when they see the mice, um, they will uh, hit them very hard, almost instantaneously, uh, the, the mouse is dead. One of the most interesting things on this bird, like an owl, she has a facial ruff here. That will channel the sound into her ears. And she will sometimes hit mice that are below a spongy layer like this. Um, she's heard them there, she'll go after them. If it's too thick, obviously, she won't be able to get them. Um, but clearly they have extremely good hearing. I also think uh, from some of the work I've been doing with satellite tagging that they are um, hunting at night. 
not very often, but occasionally. They're certainly moving around at night from the satellite tagging work. Um, on my work here is to look to see if they are actually bringing in gerbils, which are nocturnal mammals that they might be after. Haven't found any yet, but uh, hoping to uh, with more work with infrared cameras. Uh, another feature of, uh, of all harriers, and particularly black harriers, is the very long legs. You see, I'm holding her by her, uh, her legs here, and the tarsus, the bare part there, the yellow part, is very long. This is going to be uh, seven or eight uh, centimeters long, also for capturing mice um, in deep grass. And they're very, uh, very quick with these. This is why I'm holding them this way, to get these talons in your, in your skin that hurts. I've only ever had the youngsters, never had an adult to put these. With larger birds such as eagles, if these go into your, to your wrist, they sometimes come out the other side. So um, not in this particular bird, but things like crowned eagles, martial eagles have been known for some raptor biologists to actually puncture completely the, the hand and the, um, and the forearm. So they're very powerful birds. These birds would rely on, on, on hitting their prey very hard. Uh, to kill it. And as I say, it's mainly mice here in the West Coast National Park and up the West Coast areas of South Africa. The, um, you'll notice she's got very bright yellow eyes. As youngsters, they have brown eyes and they'll get very bright yellow eyes uh, as adults. And the sear, this, this yellow piece of skin on the front of the bill there, is also a guide to their, their quality. Um, the other birds can see that in the ultraviolet and it, uh, a bright yellow sear is a sign of a good quality bird, so I think this bird is in very good condition. She feels heavy. I've been watching her for about a month now, um, and she's been raising two, um, two nestlings almost to the flying stage as we speak here at West Coast National Park. So there are 16 species of harrier uh, throughout the world. Um, they're all long-winged, long-tailed species. Fifteen of those species nest on the ground. Uh, there's just one species, the spotted harrier in Australia, that nests in trees. So, of all the raptors, the owls and the harriers are the ground nesters. Um, in Africa, we've got two, the African marsh harrier, nests in, in reed beds. We've got the black harrier, which nests in more steppe-like habitat. Dry country, but in the, in the damp areas within that uh, habitat. Um, open country, not within trees. The, uh, the starred part here is where the chick is inside lifting up his egg tooth on the end of his bill, cracking the shell, um, and I can hear him in here, and I can feel him as well, and eventually he will star all the way around, or about three quarters of the way around the top of the, uh, the eggshell here, and the cap will then just come off and then he'll emerge, he'll actually hatch. That process could take another 12 to 24 hours for him to actually get out of uh, this egg. They, they have quite a variable clutch size, that's the number of eggs in the nest, which varies, can be just one egg sometimes, can vary up to five uh, eggs. That's very common to, to harriers throughout the world. Variation is almost entirely dependent on the food supply. And the food supply in this case are, are mice. Uh, voles in Europe, mice uh, in this part of the world. And when you've got a low number of mice, you have a low number of, of breeding harriers, the clutch size is low. Uh, egg size doesn't seem to vary. That seems to be um, dependent upon the size of the female herself. But the, um, the number of eggs does. Good mouse years, you've got lots of lots of eggs, low mouse years, you've got very few eggs and very few birds breeding. And that's what's interesting about these particular harriers. They will move around the country, I think, trying to find where those good mouse populations are. The chicks have been recently fed and with a bit of manoeuvring, Rob can see what was for lunch. That's mouse. So I think this, this bird on the, my left is a female, so a thick tarsus, um, and the thinner tarsus and smaller foot overall of the male on the right. That's my guess at this age. That will get more pronounced as they get older. Mm. 
Nest distribution shows that black harriers breed mostly at the southern tip of Africa and only in pristine vegetation. Here in the Overberg, the few existing black harriers build their nests on the periphery of large farms, which were once their natural breeding grounds. Because they do not nest or hunt on agricultural land, they have been forced into small patches of untouched indigenous flora. On the west coast, there's a much higher concentration of nests, all in protected areas, the West Coast National Park and private reserves to the south. At the nest, it's a long wait. The male is still out circling for prey. Food at last. He delivers the prey at her feet. This time, it's a small bird. But the father harrier doesn't stay long. Soon, he's off hunting again. Using her impressive talons and beak, the mother prepares small morsels for the chicks. After a good meal, she cleans her talons methodically. Any scent or trace of prey would betray the nest to land predators. Then it's back to guarding over her delicate chicks. Awesome. That uh thank you so much, Rob, for that uh that footage. Uh absolutely amazing species. Um, and I'm sure everybody is super jealous that you got to work so close to them. Um, I think it's time to head all the way to East Africa to visit Simon to speak about another one of our uh, buzzard species, which is of course the auger buzzard, um, and see um what it is like what it's like to get hands-on uh with yet another very very um fascinating species uh so yeah marit when you're ready i'm simon thompson and we're going to be learning about the auger buzzard this is a juvenile auger buzzard very good looking bird. In the first year they have white eyes, um, very pale, then they get browner, and then they go brown, almost blood red. And the whole body will change color, some of them are completely melanistic, all black. Uh, this individual is probably going to molt out into a white chested one, which is common. Usually females have very dark heads and dark chins, and the, fe the female is bigger. Males usually got a white chin and the male is much smaller. You can see that they have bare legs and um, quite big toes actually. She's really quite an impressively strong bird and they're often confused with eagles. People say, oh we saw an eagle today sitting on a pole. These are the common large birds of prey, medium sized large birds of prey that we get in the highlands of Kenya. Used to be extremely common. The bare legs here means that she's not an eagle. Always eagles have feathered legs and feathers that go down to the toes. This auger buzzard is called Sook. I'm not exactly sure why. Um, it's after a marketplace. And also that's the kind of noise she makes when she's asking for food. 
She came in as a youngster, um, along with her brother from a nearby lodge, uh, taken as probably from the nest by, by kids. So that happens quite a bit. We try to persuade people not to take things, but I think that's probably what happened. Anyway, she's been raised with her brother, and uh, so she's not an imprint. And um, she's going to be released here on Sorisambu soon. This is a young auger buzzard brought in a couple of months ago. Unfortunately, he is a, as a youngster out of a nest with its sibling. So he's a boy and we're going to be releasing him. And release is never a, a one-off thing. It's always a slow, soft release. So we're releasing it in these gum trees here, which is a very prominent place on the entire plain. And the hope is, is that this will become a hack site. So the old terms for a soft release. So a bird gets fed here every day until it starts to you know learn how to catch its own food it already does a bit we've been flying it um, so it zooms around and comes back when, when asked so that amazing release is not the last time we see it this amazing release if it was the last time we saw it and just drove up in a truck and let it go it would be completely irresponsible it'd be called abandonment and um, so this is a soft release. It's so important to make sure that you can come back again, feed it the next day, feed it the next day, and maintain a bit of a relationship. Absolutely nothing wrong in this. This is actually, actually exactly what you want. So we're releasing it, but I just called it back again. So this is not something that's done immediately. This is done in stages and over time. Months can go by. We're going to talk about some of the threats facing auger buzzards and other birds of prey. Uh, these birds um, really are facing sort of what I call the three P's, which is power lines, pesticides and people. Auger buzzards um, unfortunately like to po perch on power lines and they are called still hunters. They spend much of their time sitting very still on a high perch looking around. In the open plains, if you put up a pole, it'll definitely perch not. If you make the pole electrified, it'll definitely get electrocuted. So what we've seen is a huge decline in auger buzzards, as we have with other birds of prey, over the last 10 years or so. And the chief culprit is those new concrete poles with the metal cross arms and short insulators. It takes a bit of explaining, and we'll probably show you what that looks like. ili ambao kasi ambao tunafanya ni kama tumkipata ndeke ya mbao amesaumia kama huyo kabasat alikuwa amepikwa na stima sasa tukaipata tukaletewe sasa tukamtipu mkuu ukapona sasa ukiangalia mkuu yake ni nusu sasa tunamundia mwingine mkuu ya mbandia ambao ikuwe ni mkuu mzuri hawe anatembea hawe anafanya njambo lolote sasa ye hawe anasikia ye hiko sawa akawa mguu yake umefunjika sasa tuka tukaona hawezi akaishi bila mguu sasa tunamwambia mguu mwingine wa mbandia ambao ni mguu mzuri amnaweza tembea anaweza kula akiwa anajikanyangia eh eh wa tena tembea na kula kama kawaida tena yeah, kula kama kawaida yeye yeah, akiwa anajikanyangia na yeye mguu yeye anakula 
Ya nakula mzuri ya nasikia za za ya hiko na mikumiwe. We're building an auger buzzard a nest here and the auger buzzards keep failing. So first is to identify a good tree. The tree height around here is pretty small so this is quite a small tree. Um, still we have to go through the right sort of health and safety procedures to make sure that we go up on a rope rather than just clambering up. So I'm going to fire this up with just a good old catapult and you'll notice I'm holding the end of the line in my bare foot. One, two, Three. Oops. Oh, perfect. Done. So now we have to go on the other side, pick up the line, and put on another line. The reason we're building a, a nest for these auger buzzers is that for seven years they've been trying to nest here. In fact, they've had 12 uh, attempts at nesting in those seven years, twice this year. And every time they try, they get killed by baboons. The eggs get pulled out or the chicks get destroyed. The nest just around here is completely flattened again this year. And so what we're going to try and do is find a more intelligently placed nest and not too many choices in the way of trees. And then make it baboon proof. I could joke by saying we put Vaseline on a pole so they can't climb up. But actually what we're going to do is just simply put some fencing wire around it so they can't get through. And then build a fake nest and sure enough they're going to try and nest here. This is a bit too low so we're going to have to try and make a, a cross here and then put the nest higher up. Well, that was good, uh, quite successful. We've been able to build a little bit of a nest platform up there, uh, but it, it's getting dark and need to go back home, which is just down there, and then start again tomorrow. And the auger buzzers have been actually sitting in the tree right there looking at us making the, the nest. Fantastic. That was a great, uh, great insight to uh, protecting auger buzzards um, in Kenya. So thank you very much, uh, Simon, and the team at uh, Kenya Bird of, uh, Bird of Prey Trust. Um, I see, I see Rob is online. How are you doing there, Rob? Yeah, he was um, there. Can, can you hear me now? I can hear you perfectly, Rob. How are you? I'm doing very well. Um, it was great to see Simon again. Uh, I knew Simon many years ago, and I haven't seen him for about a decade, so uh, he's looking good. 
He is still uh, climbing trees and, and saving raptors. It's fantastic. Crazy. Crazy. <laughs> <laughs> As always. Perfect. Well, everybody, to, it, we've come to the part of our, our session, which I actually enjoy the most. And that is, of course, opening the floor to our audience to hear more from uh, from you. So I hope you have all your burning Raptor questions um, ready for our, our amazing speakers. Um, we've got a raised hand immediately. Uh, Neil Wilson, please unmute yourself and uh, ask your question. Uh, thank you to the uh, to the presenters for the presentations and to this your group for organizing this. Uh, I mentioned this to to Rob Simmons before, and um, I I'd like to know if there are any uh, good studies that show the teaching by parents of their offspring to hunt. Uh, particularly in eagles. Uh, now, just in terms of selection, I would predict that in raptors, which uh, where parents uh, place a huge investment in their offspring in terms of time and energy, that uh, the tuition of young uh, to, to hunt uh, there would be a strong selection pressure for that and in terms of overall fitness. But I've looked through the literature and haven't found any uh, good studies apart from the Lana Falcon, uh, where parents cooperatively breed, I mean, feed, hunt with their young uh, and where tuition may occur. Rob, I think that's directed um, at you. Yeah, yeah. Um, I just know about Harriers. I don't know about Eagles. But um, Neil, um, it's it's a difficult question to answer because I don't think there's any specific studies uh, actually done on uh, on Eagles. I do know. I think I might have mentioned it to you. There was a guy called Steve Sherrod in in the states many many years ago. Did a whole PhD and, and hundreds and hundreds of hours at peregrine nests where he found that uh, during the fledging period, the 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 peri adults would come back. Um, with live prey and release them in front of of the youngsters, and then they would chase them. I mean, it's a, it's a bit like a, a a cheetah will sometimes, you know, uh, disable, let's say, a a, a young uh, Grant's uh, gazelle or whatever. And and then you know the youngsters are watching this, and they come along and they and they practice chasing this this poor this poor animal. And I think the same sort of thing was with with Steve Sherrod's. You know, perhaps the the adult had plucked some feathers or whatever, releases the 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 prey bird in front of them, has no chance against three or four youngsters chasing it. Um, but to answer your question on on eagles, I also don't know of any studies. Um, and as you rightly say, those are. Those are, you know, that's a long term investment that that bird might take another four or five years to reach adulthood. So you've got to get it right in the time when it's at most risk, when it's more likely to die in that first year, simply because it's either going to get bashed by a power line uh, or, or pesticides or, or people, as, as Simon said. And it's got to navigate all of those hurdles. Uh, and it would be better if uh, if an adult were to actually teach it. But very often, you know, some of these birds are migratory. I'm thinking of the Wahlberg's eagle that comes uh, down to us here in southern Africa uh, from the Sahel regions. And, and and that leaves, you know, it doesn't fly with its young. Its young have to fend for themselves. And I think that's that's common for, for many species of migratory uh, birds. So I don't know that there's actually much uh, teaching going on in the eagles. And I might be wrong. You should ask uh, Simon the same question, I think. Perfect. Ulrich, do you would you like to weigh in on that by any chance? Um, yes, I can really just confirm what uh, Rob has just said. Um, the birds, they normally don't have a particular teaching method. It's more that the youngsters have to learn by observing what the adults are doing, which is obviously indirectly also teaching, but it's more that indirect method that is being used. But I'm not aware of any studies uh, to answer your question. I'm, I'm not aware of any specific studies. Interesting. Interesting. Well, there you go. Another uh, For the students listening, there's a, a potential study for you right there. 
Absolutely. Uh, <laughs> okay, Lynn, if I could just uh, mention one more thing, and that is I, I once did a study of red-chested sparrowhawks um, uh, in Giant's Castle in, in the Drakensberg of South Africa, the Dragon Mountains. Um, and I, I watched them for such a long time from, from eggs through to actually fledging. And I happened to be in a, uh, a pine plantation. Um, and every time a pine cone fell, when the youngsters were out of the nest, they would chase it and they would go and grapple with it on the ground. Um, as if it was prey. So they're almost, you know, they're learning things themselves. I've seen young harriers, uh, young black harriers, they will pick up a um, a, a sod of, of earth or, or dry grass and they will take it up in the air and they will play with it. So I think it's it's, it's that sort of play behavior that teaches them at least the the, the moves uh, which they would need if there was a was a, a living thing in, in front of them. It is a fascinating topic and uh, you're absolutely right, Kellen, that it needs to be studied in, in greater detail. Fascinating. Well, great, great to hear. There's so much still, uh, still left to be studied in in these birds. So, uh, students, take note. I know there's a lot of you online at the moment. Um, some great topics for you to to, to follow up on. Um, the next question I see there's a question from Ben. Uh, welcome back, uh, welcome back, Ben. Uh, good to hear from you again. Um, uh, fantastic film. I think this is directed to you, Rob. Fantastic film. Uh, quick question. In which months do black harriers breed? Number one. Um, have you observe, uh, observed parents shading chicks during hot periods? Number two. And being ground open nesters, uh, I would expect parents uh, to uh, try to moderate the nest temperature on hot days. Yes. Yeah, all all good questions. Um, they they are breeding this time of year, which in in southern Africa, at least, is is winter coming into spring. So so not too hot. Um, they they can start as early as May, but the peak months are um, August and September for egg laying, and they they uh, about three months later the the youngsters are are off. So they're generally finished about uh, about December. So of course in December, the middle of summer, then it is getting hot, and and indeed I have seen um, adult females who do most of the brooding. Um, actually shading the chicks as, as well. Um, sometimes a chick gets knocked out of the nest and we've even caught uh, on the camera that lovely film that um, Tadio Velasquez from Homebrew Films made of my then work. Um, he captured on a GoPro camera um, a female actually taking a chick which had been knocked out of the nest and, and gently lifting it back um, into the nest uh, and, and to shade it. When they get older, a uh, curious thing about Harriers is that the youngsters, when they can walk and uh, you know support their own weight, um, they will actually walk into the vegetation. They will make runnels of sometimes five meters long. And you can go to a nest sometimes and it will be completely empty. And you think, oh, my goodness, a predator, a caracal or, or uh, you know, perhaps a crow or, or a, you know, something, something big uh, has come down and, and taken it. If you look carefully, you'll see all of the little runnels and they go underneath the bushes into, let's say, the grass or the, the restios or whatever. Um, and there you will find them hiding away very quietly. Uh, so it looks abandoned and they're actually they're shading themselves. So once they can walk, then they're actually doing some shading on their own. Excellent. Thanks, Rob. Um, we've got a question from Holly, uh, and this is for Ulrich. Uh, you mentioned that you used a process of elimination in determining buzzards. Can you talk us through this a little? Um, basically, what it boils down to is I normally divide the diurnal raptors into 10 different groups, starting with the fish-eating raptors and the vultures and the true eagles and snake eagles and um, goshawks and sparrowhawks, etc., etc. So there are some larger raptors, um, like the vultures, the eagles, the uh, buzzards, and then there are also the smaller raptors, like the goshawks, sparrowhawks, and the harriers and those. Now, the buzzards are obviously of the larger raptors, and if one has a look at all the different groups of larger raptors, and one sort of eliminates one by one, then you will in eventually find that um, the only group that is left, if it wasn't an eagle and it wasn't a snake eagle and it wasn't a, um, um, a, a vulture, then the only group that is left by elimination is the group of the buzzards. So buzzards are a little bit difficult to describe as a group 
You know, the eagles have got fully feathered legs and the uh, snake eagles have got large yellow eyes, etc. But buzzards are a little bit more difficult to describe. And so that process of elimination actually is an easy process to make sure that you're looking at a buzzard or a rather large um, raptor. Awesome. Thank you for that, uh, Ulrich. Makes sense. Uh, we've got a, a question from Piloni. Um, where do yellow bull kites migrate to from South Africa? Well, they stay within Africa, so they would normally migrate more into Central and Eastern Africa. And they breed both there and also with us here in Southern Africa, although many of them actually breed before they arrive here with us in Southern Africa. But they stay within Africa, um, so it's an intra-African migrant. Okay, so intra-African migrants. Um, I actually have a question for you, Ulrich. Um, you were mentioning that uh, the 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 mystery buzzard in 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 Cape Town. Um, are there any characteristics that we can that we can straight away see to make to to determine whether we're looking at a mystery buzzard or a normal uh, or common buzzard uh, in that area? Um, the people that see them regularly, they actually know how to distinguish them from the other buzzards. I must say that I've, I've not grown to that level of, um, of expertise, but their wings are a little bit longer than the ordinary step buzzard. Um, and then obviously their behavior is different. So the coloration seems to be quite similar to step buzzard, but certainly their wing shape and the way that they fly is a little bit different. But that takes a bit of observation before you will really be able to see that. Okay, and and do do they utilize a different habitat? Like, will they be closer to to forested areas or or more open areas or kind of any anywhere? They are intermixed with the others. Um, so obviously, there are not many sightings of them, and um, there are also some suspected sightings from quite a number of decades ago. And so they seem to uh, have a variety of habitats where they live in, but obviously also areas where there are trees and then the cliffs that they normally do breed on. Okay. If I can add to that, uh, Kaelin, um, I, I've seen that, and Ulrich, Ulrich um, I've seen these birds. They're quite reddish uh, on the other underside, as your photograph there showed, more red and, and sort of a a plain red, if you like, um, than your your normal common buzzard, which often has a, a, a white band across it. Um, they also are quite vocal. Um, and if you hear a buzzard calling uh, in Southern Africa, um, then it's more likely to be a mystery buzzard because they're getting into their breeding, uh, which is their main characteristic, which distinguishes them from the step buzzard. Um, they're calling and they're, and they're displaying and, and you know, interacting uh, to get ready for, for breeding. Um, so uh, whereas step buzzards, at least the ones I've seen, you know, taking their, their poles around with them, as you said, Ulrich, um, they uh, they are very quiet. Uh, I don't think I've ever heard a, a step buzzard call in, in Southern Africa, but the, the mystery red buzzards, um, as uh, some people will call them, are, are actually quite a vocal species down here. All right, yeah. thanks for that. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry, what's that, uh, Ulrich? I just said that really would make sense because they would call in the breeding season and as the step buzzer doesn't breed here, so obviously they would be quiet. Um, right. That's a very, very important point there. Thank you for that. Oh, excellent, excellent. Thank you for that uh, for those answers. Um, we've got another few questions from Holly again. Uh, first one, can you talk about calls? Do raptors use different calls for contact, for example, between mating, locations, parent to child? Uh, and the second question is, do buzzards, harriers, and kites have any distinct mating rituals or behaviors? Mate choice, for example. Um, I wouldn't um, say that they're distinct from the other raptors. Obviously, they do have um, calls that, are, that they use for mating um, and in the breeding season and uh, part of their courtship behavior. And then they've got those contact calls now, in general, the calls of raptors, um, and I'm generalizing a little bit, they are fairly simple calls, um, except for a few like the fish eagle and uh, some of the um, banded snake eagles. They've got more distinct calls. 
but most of them have got very simple calls. But still, um, if one listens to those calls, the breeding season, there are certainly different calls than in the rest of the year. Um, but um, specific mating behavioral rituals just for those birds, um, that would actually go with the other rat system as well. All right. Okay. If Rob, I can like uh, also to... answer there, um, Kellen, um, uh, to add to what Ulrich said, uh, one of the reasons I was attracted to the Harriers in the first place is that um, they are known to be polygonous, uh, and that means uh, one male sometimes has two or more females. Uh, in Scotland, where the hen harrier um, has been studied extensively, um, it can have up to five um, females to one male. He provides all, all the food. He's run off his feet. Um, and he has a so-called primary female who is the first to lay, gets most of his attention, gets most of the food. And then once she's settled on the eggs, then a beta female uh, seeing a good quality male and, and seeing a good quality territory uh, will come and, and also get some courtship feeding from the male. Um, the female, the first female, the primary, doesn't need very much food during the incubation time. Um, so he, the male, the polygonous male, can afford to then go and feed the, the, the beta female and sometimes gamma and delta females on, on top of that. However, as soon as the primary female's uh, uh, clutch hatches, then the male just switches back uh, to that, that primary female and, uh, you know, will supply the, the food. And if there's any food left over, if you like, um, for the beta female, then she will get that for the gammas and the deltas. Unless food supply is really good or the territory is really good or the male is really good, then they're generally not going to do very well. So it's actually better to be a, a monogamous female where you're not competing with other with other females than it is to be a polygamous female and i think actually what is happening i studied this in the northern harriers or the marsh hawk as they used to be called as ulrich mentioned earlier and it seems that actually the the females may uh, be duped into into joining they know there's another female there the alpha female will some, sometimes come and fight them and to try and chase them off knowing that she's an interloper um, but the male wants her there, wants her to settle. She often does. They they lay their clutch. But what she doesn't know is the male is then going to switch his food supply to the alpha female. There's no way um, the, the beta female would ever know that. And she's all, sort of left on her own. Um, and that's why they do more poorly. Um, but there's, there's still... Um, Still many species of harriers. I think there's like four species of the 16 uh, which have this polygonous uh, mating system. Um, mm. I think that's the the uh, hen harrier. We found it in the black harrier, but very rarely. I think the pallid harrier is one of them and uh, the European marsh harrier uh, as well. All the exhibit polygamy, but only about 10 or 15 percent of the population, unless the food supply is very good, in which case that that uh, proportion can go up. So that that's a very fascinating part of their of their mating system. And there the uh, Australasian letter winged kite, which uh, Ulrich mentioned, I think that's got a polyandrous, which is yet another <laughs> switch on all of this in that the the female will will attract a mate. Um, and then once those youngsters are, you know, are just able to look after themselves, she will leave that male and she will go and find another male. Uh, who then she will she will mate with and, and and have another nest with and she might even leave that male so she's uh, so in that case it's it's one female having several mates either simultaneously or successively so there's some interesting shenanigans going on in in the birds of prey that is that is quite interesting actually uh thanks for that rob uh the next question is from dominic uh very nice presentation what characteristics make buzzards and harriers great casualties of wind farms i guess that's for either one of you rob or ulrich it's well, something I'm... i've specialized on actually but ulrich first no i must say that in our part of the world we have, don't have any wind farms <laughs> It would actually mm -hmm. be surprised that buzzards and areas are great casualties of wind farms. But uh, Rob, maybe you should come in here, please. It, it is a it's a great question because most people, if, if you read the European literature, you'll find that harriers are are generally not 
uh, very high on the fatality list of, of wind farms. And that's why we were surprised and even shocked the black harriers um, um, were being relatively regularly uh, struck by the spinning blades, which go up to 350 kilometers per hour at their tips. And um, I think what we found, what my partner Marley Martins and I found uh, in, in my consultancy company, Birds and Bats Unlimited, we found that the harriers would generally forage low, but when they've got to, you know, five or 10 kilometers away from their nest, which is very common, and they've caught a prey, the quickest way back for them to transport this, let's say, 60 gram uh, mouse back to, to the female on the nest is to actually start to soar. Um, and then they grow across, across country until they get another thermal, and then they will go up to, you know, 100 meters, 200 meters, or whatever it might be. And as they come down towards the nest, doing that, that whole commuting, as I call it, across country, because it's the most energetically efficient way of doing so, that's when they're within the blade swept area. And it's when they're feeding youngsters, when the food supply is at its, uh, the, the needs are greatest, that we find harriers, the black harriers, especially in October and November, you can predict the month, um, the months when more harriers are killed than, than any other month because they're showing this commuting behavior um, uh, uh, across country. To the buzzards, um, quickly, the jackal buzzard in, in South Africa anyway, is the most killed bird Forget just raptors, bird in general, um, with, I think, since wind farms have been up and spinning since 2014 in South Africa, we've got about 32, 33 wind farms. They're coming online all of the time. About 90-odd jackal buzzards have been killed. Um, and I, we think part of the reason there's a study going on at the moment. Um, part of the reason for that is they often spend a lot of time uh, within the so-called blade swept area that's from the, the bottom tip to the top tip which might be um, for a 50 meter blade that, that's 100 meters which extends from 30 meters above the ground to 130 meters above the ground and if you look at where jackal buzzards fly that's the main area uh, where they're actually flying and we think that's why they're being killed by uh, killed more often than any other species of bird, at least in South Africa. And raptors make up at least a third, about 36% of all known uh, fatalities. And that in itself is unusual because of their their, their amazing acuity. Um, and there are various uh, hypotheses, hypotheses as to why, why that would be. Uh, and other birds aren't killed as, as much. And especially gulls, so found in, in, in Europe at some of the offshore wind farms, gulls can be going past in their thousands and they've hardly had one fatality. So gulls see the, the world very differently <laughs> to, to, to raptors. Yeah, that's interesting. Um, definitely something that we need to concentrate on seeing that wind farms are coming online quick and fast. So mm. thanks for that, Rob. Um, Holly's got another question here. If that ma if male harriers provide all the food, how long does he live for? Um, so in other words, do females live longer than males? Mm -hmm. Well, that is a great question. Uh, and I'm afraid I don't have the answer for it. Um, but it is a very good question. What I didn't tell you, uh, Holly, was that um, the male, he gets fairly exhausted. You can imagine having dealing with, uh, with two or three uh, females and feeding them all. Um, he will eventually abandon um, that, that whole system. When the, when the alpha female chicks are, are ready to go, he will often abandon the whole thing. You know, he just needs a rest. And then the females have to take over. So it's not as if she's just sitting on, on, on eggs or chicks and brooding them and having an easy life. She then has to take over and to get those young to to independence. So it, it, it swings and roundabouts um, for, for the males and females. Um, the, the, the approximate age for the, the, uh, an average lifespan of a harrier would be three or four years. The oldest birds that we know of are about eight or nine years. Thanks. Uh, thanks for, for that, Rob. Uh, the next question we have is, uh, from Pilani, uh, another question from Pilani. Thank you for the uh, for your questions, Polani. I believe Pil Pilani is actually one of our uh, eco warriors out at Indumo. Uh, he's now studying at the SA Wildlife College. I'm glad you are deciding to take your your conservation career uh, forward. That's fantastic. Uh, he asks, what is the difference between a pallid harrier and a hen harrier? 
Uh, and he says, this is his last question. Please don't, don't let this be your last question. Keep asking questions. This is how we, uh, we, uh, we build our knowledge. Keep at it, Pilani. Um, so yeah, uh, Ulrich, would you be able to, to give us an answer for that? Yes, the two actually do look quite similar because they're both uh, gray above. Um, but the first uh, difference would be the distribution and also the migratory pattern. Um, if you think back of the, to those two distribution maps that I've shown, where the hen area is more a European bird and that um, just hardly migrates into Africa, although that um, distribution map that I showed was not 100% correct, they do sometimes occur south of the Sahara as well, but always still in the northern regions of Africa, whereas the pallet area certainly migrates all the way down to South Africa. Um, so depending where you see one in Africa, that would already give you a good idea what you're looking at. Um, the males are, uh, are gray, but where the uh, pallet area has got completely white underparts, the hen area actually has got a, a gray head and a gray chest with only the belly being white. And then the females and the youngsters of pallet area, hen area, and also Montague area are really very, very similar. And uh, one must look at uh, fairly minute detail and also uh, spend a lot of time to observe their behavior and even their size to a certain degree. But at least the males are more easy to distinguish from each other. Perfect. Thanks for that, uh, Ulrich. Um, and I believe the last question that we have for the night is from Anthony Robinson. Um, what is being done about the electrocution problem, if any? Um, I guess that goes to either one, Rob or Ulrich. Um, whichever can shed I, some light. I, I can, yeah, I can have a, a, a go at that question. Uh, I can only really speak for for what Escom is doing um, with the EWT and the Angel Wildlife uh, Trust in South Africa. Um, they are first of all identifying um, uh, specific lines uh, where birds have perched and have been electrocuted, um, they will then change the structure of the, of the support structure so, such that the conductors are, are no longer on top of the, uh, the supports, the pylons, the towers, whatever they're called, um, but they are slung below uh, those, those, those um, uh, support structures, in which case the bird cannot um, bridge the gap between the, the earth um, and the, the the conductor itself. I mean, that's a that's a big process. Um, I know that um, uh, Munir Varani has been doing this in far flung places like um, I think uh, Mongolia, um, and I'm sure there, there there's a whole set of of mitigations in in Kenya and and other places who who care for their for their raptors. Um, sometimes spikes, uh, plastic spikes, are, are put on uh, the, the top of the support structures to stop the birds from even uh, getting there um, so that they can't perch, in other words. Uh, that's more to do with the fouling of the line and, and, and nests, stopping uh, the large eagles nesting on the, on, the, on the lines. But changing the support structure is the most uh, important uh, thing. Um, and sometimes even a perch is added to the the line so that it um, it stretches above the the um, the conductors if they are put above the support structure, but the perch is then above that. So the bird will often want to perch at the highest level, um, and and that's where that's that's how they get around that particular uh, problem. Fantastic, thanks, Rob. Uh, Ulrich, would you like to add to that? Yeah, um, one must obviously remember that um, electrocution of whatever bird it may be, whether it's a raptor or another large bird, is really a an issue for this uh, power provider as well, because um, that often causes a power outage. So it's in the best interest of the power provider, the electricity provider, to actually make sure that um, birds are not um, um, electrocuted uh, in those areas. And so ESCOM in, in South Africa has really for many, many years has been experimenting with different designs, as Rob has uh, quite rightly pointed out. You know, long ago, we had those kite structure of um, electricity poles and um, the birds and landed inside the structure and they touched the two um, uh, the cables. And then uh, ESCOM started to put poles on top and just a very simple solution like that, that you 
actually made a huge difference. But those kite structures are now have been phased out altogether. And uh, yes, certainly the different designs of the um, of the pylons that, is, that are being um, used. Okay, okay, that's that's true. Yeah, I know there's there's still quite a few of those uh those kite structures structures out in the in the more uh, remote areas of South Africa uh, that we've seen. So yeah, good to see, good to hear that there there there's something going on about that. Uh, Brian, uh, Brian Otigo, uh, good to see you again. Uh, I see you, your your question is, um, a friend told me that painting windmill blades. I assume you're talking about um, the um, wind turbines. Wind turbines. Uh, yeah, wind turbines. Yeah, um, I believe painting wind uh, wind turbine blades uh, or the tip at least black would reduce uh, raptor fatalities. Is this something proven uh, to be working anywhere that you know of? Uh, yes, it is. Um, they did a lovely experiment in in, Nor uh, in Norway on the island of Smaller, uh, where they were regularly killing white-tailed eagles. Um, and literally, I've seen uh, photographs of, of eagles with their wings, uh, their wing completely chopped off. The bird is still alive, poor thing. Um, and they painted one blade or three quarters of, of one blade on four different turbines. Um, and then they recorded how many white-tailed eagles were, were killed thereafter. Uh, and the answer was a phenomenal answer, which was zero. The, the fatality rate went right down to zero. And for all the other species, uh, and I think there are quite a few grouse and ptarmigan type species there, that was reduced by 71%. So for the eagles, it was instantly successful. And that's because the blade then became more visible. We're just trying that for the first time. I've been heavily involved in a, in a wind farm um, in Hopefield in the Western Cape. Um, it has about 13 or 14 uh, wind, sorry, uh, 20, 29 uh, wind uh, turbines. And um, as part of the mitigation that my company suggested, we suggested it uh, have the black blade, as we call it, black blade mitigation. Our civil aviation, the South Africa civil aviation, um, didn't like that. They said, we can't paint the blades black. That's that's against our rules and, and against our legislation. But they did allow us a loophole, and that was to paint them signal red. And that's the sort of red that you get on um, uh, on towers and uh, and that sort of thing, you know, ESCOM uh, or rather Vodacom towers throughout South Africa. Um, so we did that. We painted two broad stripes um, across the one of the blades, and we're just testing that now. That only happened in January through through March. It's quite an expensive thing to do when you do it on in in situ, but um, we're very hopeful, um, and that's being rolled out now to other wind farms because we still got to test it uh, in South Africa. Just because it happened in Norway doesn't mean it's necessarily going to be um, effective in South Africa. And one of the, the biggest constraints um, suggested was, well, Norway's a cold country and you're going to have um, uh, no warming of the, the now black blade instead of a white blade. But in Africa, and they're trying it in Spain as well, you're going to have a lot of heating of that blade and it might um, it might uh, destroy the blade or disable it in some way. So we didn't paint the entire blade. We tried to get around that by not painting the entire blade, but we put two broad stripes on one of the blades, um, and and we're going to see how that affects the the blade as well. The the wind farm managers will go and check uh, to see if uh, those uh, blades um, have been distorted or or um, you know compromised in any way. I doubt it myself because you've got to remember these blades are traveling very fast, uh, up to three hundred and fifty kilometers uh, per hour at the tip. Um, so the wind should take that extra heat away. Um, I'm collaborating with guys from Pretoria uh, University um, to use a, a thermal imaging camera uh, to go and check the heat of the blades while they're spinning, both the white blades and, and the, the striped blades or the patterned blades, as we call them. So it's quite exciting times. We, we hope it works. Um, and we've got a fatality caucus team uh, assessing that for the next two years to see if it actually does work. Fantastic. Thanks, Rob. Um, Ulrich, Pilani wanted to confirm the name of the pallid, oh, the, sorry, the scientific name of the pallid harrier. Do you know that off by heart? Yeah, it is. It's the Eusocus macrolus. That's my correct. Yeah. So that is co correct. Fantastic. Yeah, and uh, I, uh, 
in my raptor guide, I actually have an origin of the name. Um, so uh, circus it doesn't refer to our modern um, um, institution of a circus, but it refers to the flying habit of various, which don't obviously fly quite in a circle, but that's why a circus is called a circle, because that, there's that, um, the stage is a circular, uh, but areas flying up and down, and, um, and uh, that particular behavior of theirs, that's quite characteristic. And the macrorus that refers to macro, obviously, is uh, large. And the urus is, uh, that refers to the tail, because pallet harriers have got a slightly longer tail than the other harriers. Excellent. Thank you for that, uh, that background. Uh, and I think Neil Neil's just mentioning that there is a company in Spain producing wind turbines without blades. So bladeless turbines, I guess, isn't it? That's interesting. Mm -hmm. Not not sure how how far we are along, along with that type of uh, technology. Rob, do you do you know of anything like that? Like that? Uh, there's been a lot of discussion um, about um, vertical axis uh, turbines, which spin on a vertical axis rather than the normal ones we see on the on the uh, in the landscape now. Um, and the idea is that you don't have to put them right up in the sky to catch the wind. It's like, for me, growing up in the UK, you used to have an old ice cream um, signs that would slowly spin on their axis, a vertical axis outside the ice cream shops uh, to, to uh, advertise Wall's ice cream. And I always thought it was a very clever design. And that spins in very low wind. It doesn't catch any birds. It doesn't catch any bats. Um, so that would be certainly a thing of the of of the future. And there are many other designs that, that clever engineers are coming up with, like vibrating trees, for example, that are are full of energy because they are actually slightly moving parts. They're not massive moving parts like a 50, uh, 50 meter blade. Uh, or even they're getting even larger blades. They're talking about 100 meter long blades now on a 200 meter high uh, turbine. Uh, so, you know, that could get very crazy. And the larger the, the, the blade and the higher the hub height, um, the more birds, unfortunately, you will kill. And there's, there's quite good evidence to show that. And uh, just, just one last fact uh, for, for those who are interested in, in the wind farms. Um, for every one bird which is killed, there are about 10 bats which are killed. So we're, we're, we are creating a, a lot of destruction um, in, in trying to save the, the planet from, from global warming. Wow, that's, uh, that's a shocking statistic there, <laughs> Rob. Uh, mm. But yeah, I guess we, we, don't, we don't think too much about the bats, uh, these tiny little things. I guess there's, there's not much left of them after uh, after incident with a, with a turbine. Um, but yeah, thank you. In, 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 interestingly <laughs> enough, uh, when they've when they've looked at bats below uh, turbine blades, um, they they are completely um, um, intact. There's oh. nothing on the on the outside uh, that looks um, wrong with them. And, and then the autopsy was done, and you know why they were killed? It's their lungs have actually hemorrhaged. In other words, burst because they're so delicate. And the reason for that is because the, the, the bats flying in the low pressure system, uh, the low pressure air, should I say, but just as the blade has swept through, that is enough to, to cause the hemorrhaging in their, in their lungs. It's called barometric trauma or barrow trauma uh, for short. So on the outside, the bat looks fine. On the inside, it, it, it's, it's completely ruined and its, and its little lungs are, are completely useless. And that's why they're dying. Hey man, that's very uh, very worrying indeed. Oh, thanks for that, Rob. I appreciate it. Um, I, I think that is it for the questions. We haven't got any more questions coming in, so I think I'm gonna call it uh I'm gonna end tonight's session. Thank you to our speakers and our presenters for uh their time and and uh answering all our questions. Um, it was fantastic having you all here, and of course, our audience, thank you for joining us. Please remember to join us again, same time, same place next week, 